Hello and welcome to The Napoleonicist and something really very, very different. It's Wargaming Month over on the main show, on the sort of radio element, the podcast itself. But here on the YouTube channel, I wanted to sort of embrace some of the opportunities that looking at a very different medium and a different means of communicating history offered. And as part of Wargaming, what better thing to do than to play some war games, which is exactly what we're going to do today. You will see, hopefully, there are some digital issues that may prevent you from seeing him, uh, but I am joined by the master of adventures in history land, one of my favourite people who owns a ponytail, uh, Josh Proven, the author of Bullock's Grain and Good Madeira and regular commentator on The Napoleonicist. He's going to be helping me to talk through some scenarios that we've put together for you on perhaps the most famous of the Napoleonic war games. That's it, well, the Napoleonic computer war games. That is Napoleon Total War, which is on your screen now. Josh, welcome back, my friend. It is really good to see you again. How are you doing? Thank you, Zach. Pleasure to be back. I'm doing pretty well. I'm doing pretty well. Just getting, getting through what needs to be done and looking forward to uh, talking about the mayhem that is this... Uh, that is war gaming in the Napoleonic Wars. Well, we've got a little series of these coming for our viewers, haven't we? Because we uh, effectively kind of dummied a couple of scenarios and then we did some, well, I'm going to say we did some playing and some war gaming. The reality is that you utterly humiliated me. Um, <laughs> but we, we will get to that in future weeks because these will go out as a series. Shall we start with the basics as I hit play on this? Uh, what you've got in front of you folks is just the deployment phase. Um, as we run through the video, we will talk through some, some basics. You will then see Josh's forces. And what we're gonna do in this one is just show you some of the mechanics of how this game works. So Napoleon Total War, where to begin? It was released in 2010, I believe, uh, by Creative Assembly. Uh, I think you were telling me, Josh, that the distribution was done by Sega. It was quite well received at the time, was my sense. The AI was very, very dumb. There was no getting away from that. Um, if you were playing against the enemy, and we, we've commented on this before because we've played these games ourselves against an artificial intelligence enemy, what you would find is that the enemy would just go for a frontal assault and it was all very unintelligent. Um, but I, my sense was that this game was very well received. Yeah, I, I, I'm never very much very aware of how sort of games are received, except for myself. I enjoyed it. Um, I'm, it, it was a bit of a departure in terms of the campaign from previous Total War uh, games, such as Empire Total War, which is the 18th century one, where is the classic Total War campaign map where you're just basically meant to conquer everything. Um, and this one is very is like more limited in the factions you can play, and you have sort of specific objectives at the beginning, and only after a certain set period of time does it completely lose all resemblance to history. Um, this the game had you could actually play as Napoleon and several other famous generals and things. Um, but yeah, uh, from what I've from what I've heard since it was released. People look quite favorably on it as still amongst sort of the classics of the of the Total War series, uh, right before it sort of uh, attained its next level, where it goes into sort of different sort of semi-fantasy stuff and sort of smaller games. Yes, the mod game was also very strong on this, wasn't mm. it? Um, there are some issues with balance, which we will talk about uh, over the course of this series, not least when it comes to the French. Um, because, well, and the British, actually, because they were very, very heavily balanced um, towards the French and the British during this period. Um, but as a, as a concept, it went down very well, but the mods were designed to make it perhaps just a tiny bit more realistic. So for folks who are observing this and wondering what the heck is happening, we're going to run through a series of separate scenarios for you, basically showing you how the game deals with some of the really basic combat elements during this period. So we're going to show you things like how morale works within this force. So you can see I've moved up 
um, a solitary line of what I believe were fusiliers, just a very basic um, type of unit. Uh, haven't done much in terms of their deployment. In fact, at this point, I think I've realized that I need to put them in three deep line to make it sort of vaguely have a semblance of um, quasi reality. And they are basically sitting there for Josh to come and take pot shots at. Um, and we're going to show you in a moment what happens. Uh, I believe we started with cavalry on this one. Josh may prove me wrong on that. Um, but just show you yes. how the, the cavalry element works in this game. Uh, cavalry being very, very powerful tools. Um, but as, as is kind of true to reality, once the horses are dead, that's the end of it. And so you can't rely exclusively on cavalry. It is worth saying that um, the, the calculations used in games such as this are quite similar to what you get in standard wargaming. I was speaking fairly recently for a, a very different uh, show to uh, a chap called Richard Cole. He's uh, a guy at Bristol who specialises in uh, wargaming and computer games that are generated around the ancient period. And he was saying that actually the origins of the the algorithms and so on and the, and the calculations that underpin these games are really very very similar to what was happening um, in the more traditional inverted commas board game uh, which will be covered in other episodes in other contexts but that sort of plastic and um, bringing your your nicely painted figures to the guide with a to the, to the table with a, a nice little rule book the, the calculations behind that are quite similar to what was used for games such as this. So Josh, at this stage, you are moving up some cavalry. Um, they are sitting there. Now, of course, it goes without saying that there's no situation in which anybody with a smidgen of competence, whether they were a general or uh, somebody who was playing the game, would just leave your infantry out there in the open ready to receive cavalry. Um, but we are just going to show you what basically happens in the, in the event of a frontal assault. Josh, what was your kind of feeling when this game first came out and you kind of saw the changes? Because you talked about how the map had changed from Empire. And Empire was very expansive, uh, as we just observed these, these uh, Russian cavalry beginning to charge in. Well, you know, uh, as a big Napoleonic Wars fan, I... I was really quite impressed with uh, the update on, on Empire Total War. And of course, I, I kind of saw it as sort of an update on Empire Total War rather than almost a game, like a full game in itself in a weird way, because the graphics are very similar, to be honest, and the way that the musketry works and everything is, is almost identical uh, to the way that Empire works. As we can see here, um, it also works quite similar in the way cavalry are used. Um, the, one of the big departures em, that happened with Empire Total War was that cavalry were not the battle winners all by themselves anymore. Um, that they take pretty hefty casualties when you throw them into things. That was something that I saw carried over um, in the sort of the combat dynamics and things like that. But say like, like, like in uh, Rome, Total War and stuff like that, if you had excellent cavalry, then you would win because you could do, you, mm -hmm. it's just such a powerful force. Uh, whereas in Empire, you actually had to rotate it like you would with ordinarily with cavalry, like you charge them, they do their damage, get them out, reform them and throw them in again. Now with this example here, we've demonstrated that infantry in line, no matter what you do with it in this game, if the cavalry get them, it's still over, but I, you'll notice that I lost a considerable amount of horses um, because I had attacked that line frontally. So I would say that I felt that it was a good update on the uh, Empire Total War and a good update for fans of, of this period. And there are a lot of fans of this period who wanted uh, a Napoleon game. Absolutely. One of the things that you'll also have seen there is I moved uh, the general forward. This was another departure from previous Total Wars where the general actually sort of meant something mm. um, in that you could use the general to inspire. Now, the idea was that I was going to bring him forward to rally that routing unit. It didn't happen. What I'm also going to just flag for people, you might notice that the morale indicator has plummeted as these men move forwards. 
And we're just demonstrating a slightly different form of attack here. So as Josh goes in from two sides, then you see the same kind of thing happening. The, the, the unit routes, but mm. Josh sustains far fewer uh, losses in this instance, um, and the French promptly run away. Um, so that gives you a little bit of an indication of how this works. And it's it, it works in a similar kind of way that you'd expect. You know, that in terms of the calculation, there is a bonus that is gained um, by being on the charge as opposed to standing on the defensive and, and so on. Um, but the big thing uh, and the thing that we, we end up laughing about a great deal is the ability to form square and just <laughs> how swiftly that happens. Before we get to that, though, um, we are going to try and demonstrate, but we didn't actually succeed in demonstrating, just how absurdly overpowered the artillery was in this game. So this is um, a what was what is called a grand battery of the convention. I'll be honest, I'm not entirely convinced that it has any grounding in reality, but the concept is, I think, related to Napoleon and his grand batteries and that kind of massing of firepower. So what happens is that you can buy these incredibly big artillery units, um, eight pieces. Most artillery units in this game are, are three pieces. And it provides a massive concentration of power. So again, it's a kind of an indication that the developers were trying to make a nod towards some of the historical elements of this period and that famous Napoleonic tactic of the Grand Battery, though by no means unique to this period. Um, so this uh, battery has opened fire, and you can see again the morale impact. Um, the uh, Serassiers on uh, Josh's side starting to lose a little bit of morale as they come under fire. Now, in a moment, Josh is going to charge this ground battery, and we're going to try and demonstrate what happens with canister. But as you can see, um, I've I've shot my canister far too soon, <laughs> yes. um, and so. <laughs> Over the course of this charge, um, as we were recording this, I'm quietly muttering to myself, come on, reload, reload. Why are you taking so long? This is, this is intolerable. Um, and I was convinced that his, his men weren't going to make it. Um, but, spoiler alert, they absolutely did. They absolutely um, did. <laughs> and, and what you get is a sort of, in fact, some <laughs> charge all the way through to the light infantry on the other side. Um, mm -hmm. And what you basically get is, um, well, a bloodbath, really. Um, mm. Cavalry against gunners, and it, it doesn't end well for the gunners. So we didn't quite demonstrate what we intended to, which was that frontal mm -hmm. cavalry assault against canister doesn't work. But what we um, did, what we did demonstrate was the classic total, Napoleon and Empire total war struggle with artillery reloading. Uh, because there's no, they, they, the game developers didn't take into account that people might speed up reloading their pieces uh, <laughs> in the face of, a, of enemy, enemy troops attacking them. They just, you know, it, there should be t-shirts with like, they, like they, there should be t-shirts and memes from the Total War community about the, the awful struggle of seeing your artillery just get overrun because they can't reload fast enough. Yeah, I think it was perhaps the only way that they could um, counteract the overpowered nature of artillery, wasn't it? Because but, as, as you said at the beginning as well, you can see uh, it, while you were firing round shot at the cavalry, cavalry didn't like it. And actually, um, but, you know, cavalry can be absolutely decimated by artillery in this game, uh, mm. round shot especially. What we've just seen in front of us is that this line of fusiliers was formed in square and what we decided was to try and give an indication of just how quickly uh <laughs> the units in this game form square and um just how late frankly you could leave it before mm -hmm. forming square and, and still what get we're doing here as well is that uh, i run my general up behind my my cuirassiers uh to improve their morale and as you were saying before Generals don't do very much in this game. They're very important in other Total War games. But because you could literally rally troops as they were running away in old Total War games, which is so useful. Um, but here, all they do is they kind of just boost morale very gently 
by their presence. Yes, um, and what we also saw slightly earlier was that on my side, my general was really quite ineffective. So it's all about timing. You have to be quite preemptive if you're going to use your general well. Absolutely. So here, here come we are. Cerassiers. Um, they fire a volley, form a square, and by some kind of miracle, <laughs> they somehow managed to see off this cavalry assault. Um, it's really quite incredible. Uh, it's worth so, saying that in reality, yes. to form a square would have taken far, far longer. It's a much more complex manoeuvre of folding wings inwards mm -hmm. and inwards, as opposed to line just sort of kind of merging outwards. Yeah, materialising. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's really quite bizarre. Um, and then we also saw uh, my six pounder artillery opening fire there, um, mm -hmm. somehow managing to avoid a friendly fire incident, um, which is really quite surprising. So it that is. is how you see off cavalry in mm -hmm. this game. Um, and it, it doesn't matter in, in this game, the, the dynamic is like so weird because so long as the cavalry have not made contact, you can press that square button. And even though the cavalry hit you, you'll still form the square. And the bonus for forming the square will be applied and the cavalry will rout. It doesn't matter how close you are. It's absolutely absurd. You actually, I said it during when we were doing the game, you press the square button too early because in a way, this is true. <laughs> you still had time. <laughs> yes. I mean, there were probably still another three seconds that I could have uh -huh. waited um, when it came to form the square because the, the take up time is just so, yeah. so rapid. Um, the, and like you say, actual squares, I mean, they could be formed very fast, but it was like within a minute to something like that is more the time we're talking about. As opposed to about three seconds flat. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what we're going to do now is also demonstrate how overpowered certain units were. So we never really demonstrated the power of the Grand Battery of the Convention. Uh, tune in to our reenactment of Lin Yu that really went completely wrong um for an indication of just how powerful the grand battery can be um but i have moved forward an old guard unit and this is going to kind of show you the ability of the game to just completely play on some of the classic tropes of you know the guard dies but it doesn't surrender kind of um mentality in the meantime i am trying to rather unsportingly kill josh's general uh, i have opened up with a six pounder battery um and you, basically you I'm to, i know I'm, I'm trying to secure a lucky shot josh i think has quite sportingly kind of moved his his men up in range um for the purposes of the demo you have to you have to show some things you know i did good play in this game you really shouldn't you really shouldn't expose any cavalry to uh, artillery fire and if you lose it as we were saying before the general isn't terribly powerful but he is quite useful. See, the general's dead now. Um, I see. He is quite useful in terms of morale, especially if you're one of the weaker factions, which we can talk about, you know, when we talk about the sort of the various strengths of the factions. But uh, you really need the general if you're like Spain or, um, or the Turks or something like that. So at this stage, what we've done is we've essentially started moving some things up to look at the next phase of demonstrations. But you can see the morale impact as well. So uh, with the general dead, the nearby units are sort of struggling a little bit when it comes to morale. Um, mm -hmm. But it's starting to look as though this gun isn't particularly well sighted, although it looks like quite a grassy, grassy flatland. Um, I'm noticing a lot of shots skimming. It's, it's not particularly bad, the terrain. Um, but what you you do also get is that kind of that ricochet effect uh, in this game. So if you do position the, the ground in a lot of games does undulate and so you can use terrain to your advantage, which was another nice feature. You know, it wasn't yeah. just a, a brainless um, kind of thing that was going on here. Ah, Josh is now trying to make my square route. Um, yes. Again, just kind of proving that thing that if you leave your your forces are sitting up, then again, the game will punish you for that. Mm -hmm. um, so a, a, realis, a realism element there. And you can see the punishment that, you know. That, yeah. I, you know, I brought up a battery of guns now and it's, um, it's firing on the square. 
and at the same time we have musketeers coming in to take on the old guard so mm -hmm. equal in numbers and, and you're just going to see watch, that watch as they get further and further away from their supports this is a good point you can see that just as we roll just the, slowly uh, file So the general has now run away. The general's dead. His his bodyguards have just decided they to call today. <laughs> really. <laughs> Bad day at the office. Uh, yeah, and what you were saying before about the, some of the realism aspect they put into this, it is rather nice, I always found, with the artillery, that if you want to, you can, basically to use them effectively, you do have to sort of zoom right in behind them to make sure each gun doesn't have a hill in front of it, because mm -hmm. you'll basically render it useless if you, if they can't fire, uh, hit what they hit the enemy, because if there's a hill in, in the way, just <laughs> they'll keep firing. You can't, you can't elevate individual guns and stuff like that. That's a nice. This is true. This is true. So this is something that I was never a fan of, is the bounciness of the camera. Mm -hmm. um, uh, from a, a graphics perspective, what were your thoughts on things like uniforms? Uh, did you feel that there was too much of a focus on the old tropes? Um, yeah, it, they're, they're, I mean, they're simplified armies, you know, they're simplified troop mm. types, everybody's kind of just as you expect them to be from the sort of like picture books you had when you were little. Um, mm -hmm. There's nothing you're now going to see is uh, the impact yeah. of a bayonet charge and, and the massively overpowered nature. Yeah, this isn't so going to go well. It's not. So it's a frontal assault. It would be absolutely um, to do that on your own as a lone battalion mm -hmm. would not be a smart move. Um, and you, you saw yourselves there it took all of about three seconds um so mm -hmm. again you know it's not just uh, an unintelligent game in terms of mm -hmm. you can stand there and blaze away you can be very proactive in terms of how you mm -hmm. play this uh, and you can bring tactical elements in and i think a little bit of basic tactical awareness does count for a great deal in mm -hmm. this game um in terms of being able to to play kind of effectively but we were talking about morale and how overpowered the French are. So you've now got two uh, batteries playing on this square and firing upon it. And still the morale is <laughs> not at rock bottom, which is <laughs> frankly quite ridiculous considering that they've lost uh, about two thirds of their numbers. So it, it just reinforces that, that kind of concept that the developers did give the French side and as we'll see the British mm -hmm. side a bit of a, well, no, not even a bit of a skewed advantage, but a massively skewed advantage. Uh, yeah, it can't really be denied when you play the game, especially if you play as, say, I'm the Russians here, um, and you play against the French, you will find it just so much harder to make headway, and you have to work almost twice as hard uh, to make sure you, you sort of get the enemy to do what you want them to do and to get the same breaks that you can get when you play as the French, who are just much stronger within the game. Um, circling back to the uniform thing a while ago, it should be noted that everybody in this game is wearing 18, 12 sort of uniforms, nothing else. So you don't get any bicorns or anything like that, or like early, early sort of war uniforms. Every, everybody's like 18, 12 to Waterloo period, which is a little annoying. But um, you, it's, it's a video game. You can't have too much. They can only do so much. And that's what the mods are for. Thought I would mention that. This, this is a really good point. Um, the other thing that rankled with me slightly, and granted, this is sort of uh, me as a, one of the more skeptic commentators on Napoleon, mm -hmm. but I did find the... Ah, finally, that, that square yeah, gone. Um, It's taken them long enough. Um, I did find the tutorial um, very ultra pro Napoleon. This was very much, I felt, put together for French and uh, American audiences, where there seems to be a little bit more sympathy 
for Napoleon out in the US, not exclusively by any means, um, but generally speaking, perhaps more sympathy for Napoleon. Um, and, and you saw that in the intro video as well with this sort of alternate reality thing where HMS Victory gets burnt and this guy comes on in a stereotypical um, French accent. Can we please just pause for a moment and acknowledge that Napoleon didn't speak in a French accent. He was Corsican and spoke in a very thick Corsican accent, but that's by the by. Granted, you know, there are sacrifices that you have to make when you're creating something that is just here to entertain. Um, but that intro section was um, interesting. <laughs> yeah, so the intro video was interesting, but the tutorial was very sort of hero worshipy. It was almost sort of mm. cult Napoleon put the guy on a pedestal. Um, wasn't he just a lovely guy? And the historian in me sort of looks at it and goes, hmm, I could have a few conversations with the people who put this storyline together, but you have to acknowledge, and, and this is the tension with these things, that these are here to entertain. Mm -hmm. The um, I, I sometimes feel like a lot of people who you talk to online pretty much got their history from that intro video and um, and the, the tutorial, like, I am a force of nature, everybody hears me, you know, thing, thing, like, thing like that. But you get that a lot online like you, you couldn't be beaten except by general winter and stuff like that that's you know high tier kind of um call them uh, the admirers of the emperor <laughs> kind of thing uh which doesn't have a great basis in reality and, and to be honest with you i've always felt that overly hyping someone's abilities and whatnot like that actually kind of detracts from the skill it takes to command an army like napoleon could actually to be honest um if you take away the humanity of of a commander in chief you know if you make him a god who can do anything who has no flaws and no, and no weaknesses in in battle or or stuff like that then he just can't be beaten he's not interesting anymore to be honest if napoleon couldn't be beaten he wouldn't be interesting this is true this that is very true and it's worth just pausing to continue to consider that humanitarian element here as we observe this um, musketeer regiment trying to um, mm -hmm. break this fusilier unit that's deliberately been deployed in square. I haven't just been an idiot there. If you're wondering, listeners, this is- uh, yes, this, is the, this is the musketry test. It is, um, and, and it's working, you know, you can see them dropping away. Um, I was quite pleased that the graphics weren't overly gory. Yeah. Um, I say that as somebody who plays uh, amongst other things, Call of Duty uh, a fair bit, where you, you have an option, you have a gore filter actually now, mm. where you can deliberately tone down uh, all of that. But if you want to, you, you can leave the, the gore element on and it's really quite gory. Um, and, you know, for, for some folks, mm -hmm. it would be really quite distressing at some of the, um, the animations that play out when people receive wounds. Um, this... I don't know if it was that was deliberate because they were marketing this at, at age what 12 plus I think maybe even slightly earlier mm. uh, slightly younger players um, but the lack of a gore element I thought was nice um, in the sense that yeah it just had that little that little tone of respect I mean yes you can see that once some of your characters fall then you know the, the bodies start to, to line up on the battlefield but it wasn't gratuitous, you know. So when we mm -hmm. saw the artillery firing on the um, the square, you know, you weren't getting huge blood spray patterns mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, do you think that was just something to enable them to uh, market it to to younger viewers, or do you think there was a conscious decision going on there? It's a good question. It's kind of hard to. Hard to answer from from sort of a player's perspective. I, I can see how it would have been a big discussion for the for the for the um, designers, the, the developers. Uh, what we can say is that up to this point, Total War had kept it sort of like PG thirteen kind of level um, violence. Uh, there is no there's no blood or dismemberment in the games up to this. I believe. I think that when they did Shogun two. They they introduced a blood pact that you can activate, 
And I may be telling a lie here because they toyed with us a little in medieval too, where as, as troops would continue fighting, they would get sort of slightly bloody as they fought. Mm. Um, but it was never really anything too massive. They would just sort of become kind of darkened in a sort of a reddish hue. Yeah, I agree. Mm. I, and I think it was probably, it was probably to do with sort of, they kept the game this rating to this point and they weren't interested in sort of being edgy here and sort of we'll keep it within what we've been doing and sell it at this level. But I also agree. Um, one understands that it's a sanitization to, to, to do that, to have a guy just sort of react and fall down. Um, you know, that's obviously not what human beings go through when the bullet hits them. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know that. And the thing is, we do have to recognize that this is a video game. We're not actual generals. We're not actually killing anybody here. So actually, what is the point in doing that is, is what I feel, to be honest. Okay, you can say, oh, I'm, I, I need to see the horrors of war as a, as a form of respect. You know, okay, sure, that's a, that's a point of view. You're welcome to that. For my money, though, um, that's unnecessary. Yes, uh, I think that's that's very well said. Um, just to, to talk you through some of the things that you saw on your screen. So that um, that square, which was uh, in the center of that musketry duel, deliberate, it automatically deployed out of square and into line when it ran out of a certain number of men. So that wasn't me uh, responsible mm -hmm. for that. Josh has just moved forward his uh, six pounder horse artillery with the intention of um, firing on this militia unit so that we can actually demonstrate the impact mm. of canister. Um, my estimate is one volley at that range and the, the militia unit will run away, partly because they're a militia unit, so they'll have lower morale anyway, mm -hmm. um, and partly just because how utterly effective canister could be if you timed it right, unlike what I did earlier on. <laughs> um, so there you, you see it firing away um the morale drops i think they're going to take a second volley yeah they should do i think another thing to okay. notice is here we go another thing to notice uh with the square and indeed this is how i've had to use multiple troops to support each other in order to keep the morale up mm -hmm. like dead so he can't help them with that anymore. And there is a nice thing in this game, whereas if, where if, you, if you advance isolated units against a large amount of the enemy, the, the, they suffer morale penalties for not being connected to any friendly troops. Um, and that was what I had to do here. Otherwise, a lot of the tests wouldn't have worked because a lot of the men would have just run away before they got into fighting. Ah, uh, here's the kamikaze charge. <laughs> yes. What was the purpose um, of this? <laughs> I think we were just doing a little experiment to see how overpowered the um, the general was at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. There we go. Ah, uh, yes, as opposed to, that yeah. Like in Rome, Total War, you might have actually got away with this because generals in Total, like the ancient battle ones and medieval are actually ridiculously powerful uh, mm -hmm. units. Um, and at this point, I think we just sort of went to hell with it, didn't we? Because we'd, we'd yes. demonstrated all of the major points that mm -hmm. we wanted to. Um, I think uh, the old guard I'm just sending in as a, as a bayonet charge. We've still mm -hmm. got Voltigas, so this is a point to make that you don't just get a generic light infantry unit and a generic uh, infantry battalion on uh, the main nations in this. Um, and by main nations, I'm talking British, French, uh, the Russians, the Austrians, the Prussians. Um, some of the smaller nations, they do just go with generic units. Um, but even the, the Spanish, I think, had the Wallonian Guard, didn't they? Yeah, um, each, each, each faction has a couple of sort of what you call elite units. I think there is like one, what is it? I think Portugal has the least sort of troop types. You can use the Spanish have elite infantry of the Walloon Guards, and they have some Catalonian sharpshooters, I think, which are sort of riflemen. Um, 
And of course, the French have, uh, like you say, like as you've seen, chasseurs and, and voltageurs. So here again, we've seen the we've seen two things. So Josh's horsemen were uh, he is, yeah. I formed square and still managed to create some sort of square. But you also saw the Jaegers uh, using some light infantry behavior. So they were deliberately pulling. Josh hadn't pulled them back. He just stuck them in light infantry mode. And they have this automatic tendency to pull back in the face of an advancing enemy, um, mm -hmm. which is another nice little touch, I felt. But here, the, the guard is very definitely going to die. And there they have yeah. routed. And as a, as a good sort of example of what I was saying before about the headway morale works in the game, even the elite unit here, the old guard moving forward like that alone, did not like it at all. And they suffered morale penalties as soon as the Ego started firing at them. So this is, uh, there are certain principles that the game encourages that are reflected in history, whereas you must keep a concentration of forces together if you're going to be effective in, uh, on the field. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and I think that was one of the things that, that was nice about the game. You couldn't just be suicidal. You had to be sort of halfway intelligent about it. Um, so yes, yeah, so at this point, we are we just experiencing We're just trying to finish the game, yeah. <laughs> we are literally trying to wrap things up. Um, the Voltigias uh, are taking a hammering on all sides. Um, I think they're going to withstand a bayonet charge. Um, the, the foot artillery, uh, you know, at this point, you quite obviously lost a battle. Um, <laughs> I've, just, I've just kind of gone charging with everything. Um, yeah. So that kind of gives you a, a sense of, oh, <laughs> there you go. So artillery overpowered uh, much. Mm -hmm. um, overpowered, but maybe fairly so. I always find, I mean, artillery was very powerful on a Napoleonic battlefield. And to be honest, actually, the thing about the artillery in this is that I think they are rightly overpowered, but to, they're quite difficult to maneuver it unless they're horse artillery, which isn't quite isn't quite accurate. They should be more mobile. You should be mm -hmm. able to, should be able to throw them around a bit. Yeah, it's it's quite a slow and painful process, isn't it? Um, and then Josh is going to charge in, and finally, uh, so he's got to use his elite yes. uh, units to to break this final artillery unit. But because yeah. so yeah, so that gives you uh, a little sense of how this game works. Please remember to drop a like and subscribe, but more importantly, come back for more because having shown you some of the mechanics of the game, we are. Uh, going to show you some more mechanics actually because there is a whole other side to this as a naval element which we're going to play through in a future video coming out in a few days time but also we're going to show you how these um how this plays out in practice i'm going to do a dummy run of lean you for you which really got thrown on its head right from the start this has been the napoleon assist i've been joined by josh proven thanks very much for watching and we'll see you again soon <laughs>